Interesting moment um, when Fox News' Sean Hannity asked GOP leadership if they were fully in line with the Make America Great Again agenda. Let's watch. The agenda that I just laid out, which is pretty much the Trump agenda, the Make America Great Again agenda, America First agenda, uh, do you disagree with any of the items that I think Republicans ought to be focusing on? I agree with all of the items, Sean, that you laid out. And most importantly, voters across this country agree. All right, Democratic strategist Roger Fisk and congressional reporter for Axios, Elena Treen. They join us now to discuss. Elena, let me start with you. You covered some of these uh, GOP leadership war shenanigans. I was struck particularly that Elise Stefanik, who actually voted quite a bit against many of the things that Trump put forward while in Congress, was hailed as this like MAGA hero. And that Chip Roy, who actually, you know, I guess, dared to run against her for that leadership position was then blasted um, by the president, even wishing up primary against him for that act. What did you make of, of all of this craziness happening on Capitol Hill over the last week? Well, I think, you know, it answered one of the biggest questions following the November election, which was what does the future of the party look like in a post-Trump Republican party? And um, I think at least in the House, we kind of saw that answer. It's still the party of Trump. And that video clip made it very clear when Sean Hannity said, no, this is the Trump agenda. Do you agree with it? And Congresswoman Stefanik said, yes, I agree with every facet of that. Um, and, and the reason I think you make a very good point, at least Stefanik, you know, Liz Cheney is actually far more, at least when it comes to the issues, conservative than Elise Stefanik. But she's someone who leadership in the House, um, really, at least House Republicans, I mean, uh, doesn't see her as a distraction. And that was the big thing. They think that she will uh, be aligned with them, particularly when it comes to embracing the former president and um, you know leading the party in that direction. And she was one of the biggest defenders of President Trump during his first impeachment trial. That's really when um, a lot of people in the party, including the House Freedom Caucus, you know, very conservative, um, embraced her as a rising star right. of the party. And we saw her district actually, you know, back when she was first elected, it was much more of a moderate district. Um, this year or in 2020, uh, far more red, far more conservative. And Congresswoman Stefanik, we kind of seen her move with that district become a little bit or far more conservative um, over time over the past few years. And so as we look ahead, uh, now the three, the top three in House Republican leadership will be aligned when it comes to President Trump. What do you think, Roger? Uh, I just think it's amazing. You can vote for the Paris Climate Accords. You can vote for the equality. All of these things, by the way, I was told repeatedly, if you are a rhino, if you don't support any of these things, and he can become the number three leader in, in the House just by defending Trump um, on impeachment. Well, first off, good morning, Sagar, and it's wonderful yeah. to be here with Elena. Um, this, let me first, this is d delicious, right, when I put on my Democratic hat, but let me just <laughs> answer as an American for a second, because I think this is tremendously sad. The video clip that you just showed could very easily have been, you know, a, a pasty black and white clip from East Germany in the, in the 70s or something. This kind of limp resignation, this servility um, of these characters who you can just see um, feel completely hollowed out by the fact that they've hand over, handed over themselves part and parcel, not to a set of principles, not to fiscal discipline, certainly not to family values or anything else. It's all transactional. And Elena's point about about uh, Representative Stefanik is 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 spot on. Um, and when she, when Representative Stefanik says that the American people support this i guess what's missing in her sentence had she had another 30 seconds she would have gone on to say if you set aside the house the senate the white house and two special elections in georgia the my final point would be this when you go to fabrizio's post-mortem from the trump election mm -hmm. the very qualities that they are willing to genuflect towards and submit themselves to which is this bizarre kind of incoherent cult, um, are the very things that turned off suburban educated families, which they are now continuing to bleed. So they can double down on this, they can, they can triple down on it, but it leaves America in a very, very poor position because we need, and I'm, I'm surprised to be the one saying this, but we mm -hmm. need a healthy, vibrant Republican Party, and we do not have that right now.
Elena, here's my question for you, which is how does this manifest itself within the Biden presidency? Because this is something which I just don't really understand, which is that because everything is still captivated on January 6th and with Trump, is that in terms of opposition, we saw Kevin McCarthy go to the White House, generally staunchly opposed to whatever's being put forward, but they're not really engaging with the actually current party in power. So what does the GOP you know, opposition to Biden look like whenever so much of the discussion is even focused on Trump himself? I mean, it's an excellent point, and I think it's one of the big reasons we saw this ouster happen. I mean, they House Republicans had their retreat in Orlando, Florida, a few weeks ago, and you know they they all want to talk about unity. They all come out saying we're unified on the issues, we're focused on winning back the majority in 2022. But the biggest news that came from it, and what everyone kept talking about, was the feud between Liz Cheney and Kevin McCarthy. And that's one of the big reasons they wanted to get rid of Liz Cheney, because they said that she was a distraction, of course. Um, it was just her disagreeing with the mm. former president and his rhetoric. And, and I know, you know, a lot of people, I have to point out, a lot of Republicans in the party actually do agree um, with Liz Cheney. They just are very much afraid of, of publicly criticizing the former president. And uh, we see why, you know, they see it as political suicide. You're going to get an attack, you know, not on social media anymore now that he's been suspended on Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere, but um, through his statements, through his advisors. And so um, it's a huge deal, but you're right. Instead of focusing on, you know, they really, it's a time right now where they should be unified. They have, right. um, you know, they did very well last year in the House, uh, Republicans did in, in 2020 and winning back um, a lot of seats. They have, a, they should, you know, if history shows, they should win back the majority in 2022. Um, but rather than focusing on, on their opposition to the Biden administration and Democrats, they've been really dealing with this intra-party division. And so um, I, I think they're hoping that they'll start um, going back to attacking the issues rather than their own internal politics. Um, but for the, for the foreseeable future, I think that the focus will still be on kind of how they, they continue to navigate uh, the future of the party yeah. in a post-Trump world. No, I think you're right. And, uh, you know, the long I, that, you know, Roger, this is the amazing. They put your campaign hat back on, which is that, you know, traditionally party in power, they're not going to necessarily have a very good time in the midterm elections. And yet, I mean, when we're looking forward at what is being put to the American people, it's basically just litigating January 6th over and over and over again, which I can't help but think, you know, worked pretty well in this swing state called Georgia um, and isn't necessarily going to work all that well going forward. What do, what do you make of the Democrats' chances there, given all these dynamics with the Republican Party, Roger? Sure. In an operational sense, and to link this with our, our exchange of a moment ago, with the vote on this commission, now that it's out of committee, is really going to be kind of the dividing line between um, the extent to which some of these folks are willing to just completely surrender themselves. Um, to speak about this through a political lens, you know, the uh, the gains of the opposing party, the party outside of the White House, have very often ended up setting the context for the re-election of the president. I think it's widely accepted that it was the excesses of the Gingrich revolution in 94 that allowed President Clinton to be re-elected, and likewise the um, excesses of the 2010 GOP class that allowed President Obama to frame himself as moving forward rather than backward. So in a, in a way, the temporary victory could be for them winning uh, next fall. I think it's actually right. going to be more uh, difficult than we might think right now, especially if the Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene roadshow keeps going. I think the mm -hmm. best thing the Democrats could do would be to buy them an hour of TV every single night in about 15 states for the next 18 months. Um, but even if they even if they get it back a, uh, in the fall of 2022, that could very well uh, establish a very sturdy foundation for a second Biden administration. That's a good point. That's a good point, actually. OK, guys, stick with us. Team Rising. We're back with right after this.